I got roped into this in the last couple of minutes, so I did not dress for the occasion. <laughs> Please apologize. Um, I, I was delighted to, uh, to, to be here tonight, number one, to hear this presentation, but I was really delighted uh, for Mark because uh, we've been through a, a number of directors since uh, JC passed away, and, and each have had their strengths, but we really have not had a true plantsman and somebody who, as I say, gets it uh, here in a long time until we got Mark. And we're really, uh, really pleased to, to have someone here of that caliber. I've had the pleasure of spending almost a month with him on the road uh, in foreign countries in some pretty uh, difficult circumstances. And he is absolutely awesome to travel with. And I believe me, I cannot say that about everybody. So. <laughs> I'm uh, really excited about the, uh, the book. I did have the chance to uh, preview it uh, a month or so ago and uh, really was blown away uh, because I've read a lot of the regional gardening books and a lot of them are not really fabulous. They're sort of dumbed down versions, but this really was incredibly readable. It was fun to read. It's really a lot of great plants and I couldn't be more thrilled, so I'm delighted to have the opportunity here tonight to hear along with the rest of you and uh, get a copy of the new book. So turn it over to Mark. That, that's, uh, I can only go downhill after that <laughs> from Tony. What Tony didn't say, can y'all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. What Tony didn't say is he was the one who pointed, I don't know if I have to thank him or blame him for uh, pointing Timber Press in my direction for this book, so. Um, but it, it, was a, it was a lot of, a lot of fun to, to write the book. Um, everybody asked me how I managed to do that. You know, you're busy, I'm traveling, I'm, you know, how do I, how do I did that? But it was actually pretty easy because my wife was in school. And so we were acting like college students. She was a college student. And uh, we were going to the, the library, the Hunt Library every weekend. And we spent Friday evenings there and Saturdays and, and uh, sit near each other at least. We didn't, you know, we were both doing our work. But, so it was actually pretty easy. So uh, when she goes back to school, that's when I'll start on the, the next one. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, I can get that one. I know where the light switch is. So, uh, you know, oh. <laughs> gardening in the South. I have, uh, I have have had the pleasure of living kind of all across the South, the, the regions that, that are in the South. You know, I, I went to school and got my degree at, at Virginia Tech and worked at a nursery up in the mountains and obviously been here in the Piedmont and spent almost a decade on the coastal plains. So, so I really have had a chance to kind of try to grow plants in a lot of, of different areas. Um, you know, you can really... You can do paint with broad strokes are pretty pretty fine. This is pretty broad strokes when you talk about the regions, and I kind of broke it up into the 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 highlands, the eastern highlands, and the Ozarks and Piedmont, and then the coastal plain, and kind of included the the Mississippi River Valley. Although soils are a bit different, it's still got some some similarities. Um, you know, the mountains get a lot of you know, really rocky soils that you have to deal with. Um, you know, invariably, wherever you want to put it, you know, that really, that special plant, that prized specimen is right there. It's going to be a bedrock right where you, you stick your, your uh, shovel in. I have Suzanne Edney to thank for this picture. I, and I'm just saying that because I think this is one of the most incredible um, <laughs> compositions I've ever seen. That, um, you know, it's, it's almost, you know, the color, from the fall color from the garden up into the mountains is, is seen. Um, you know, of course, the Piedmont, we know that, that. and we're mostly clay soils uh, in, in the Piedmont, in the coastal plain, a lot of sandy soils, salt spray, although I, I had a house in, in the coastal plain, and we had clay in our yard. We did not have sand, so I feel like I was kind of ripped off there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I added a, a fourth kind of region, because it's, it's something that I think gets skipped a lot, and that's urban areas, um, you know, because places like Birmingham and Raleigh and Atlanta have more in common with each other than they, they really do with um, kind of the region that they're, they're settled in. They're all, you know, it's not very good soils where there is soil, not much space for plants, pollution. So I won't talk a lot about the urban environment, but, but it is important and I do, I do want to, you know, point that out that we need to, when we think about gardening, we need to think about cities, not just suburban landscapes because the majority of people are living in cities. 
Um, and so, you know, how we deal with the water as we pave over more and more, you know, with rain gardens, how we deal with the heat island and pollution is going to be important. This is Mexico City. I mean, they're, they're trying down there at the airport, that big green walls, yeah, green roofs. You know, that's a green roof. That's more Farms Botanic Garden. I mean, that's a great meadow they got going there on the rooftop. But, you know, there's some things that are quintessential to the South. Um, <laughs> I don't have a recipe for how to make a, a tire planter, but see, this is the new South. To the old South, it would have been white uh, painted tire. And now, now we're getting fancy, we're sophisticated, we're matching our, uh, our flowers with our planters uh, in the South. So, I have a confession to make. I am a lazy gardener. I give a whole talk called Plants and Plans from a Lazy Gardener. My wife's over there nodding her head, yes, uh, that I am a lazy gardener. This is what I want to do in a garden. I want to sit and watch it. I know there's some people who garden for the, for the act of gardening. I love plants. I garden so that I'll be surrounded by cool plants and interesting plants. But, um, you know, I don't always want to be out there in July and August weeding my garden. And um, I sometimes let it go when it gets really hot and nasty. And I get back out there in the fall uh, when it gets a little bit better. That is not my, my hammock. My hammock, <laughs> my hammock has many more tassels than that. <laughs> so the most important thing are soils. Uh, you know, probably hear that over and over again if you garden, that soils are the most important thing uh, to do. Adding organic matter is important. So this is how you do it. You put four to six inches of sticks in the bottom, and then brown stuff and then a maximum of four inches of green stuff, and then more brown, and then more green, and then you top with brown. And then you keep it as moist as a, as a wrung out sponge. That is the most ridiculous thing I have ever seen in my life. Does your garden ever produce brown material in alternating with green material? And what do you do when you get, if you get more than four inches of green material? Do you just throw that in the trash can? What, what, what is that? This, I, I could pull up probably 20 different iterations of this off the internet that are all just as stupid and all keep people from composting because obviously composting is, is complex, um, you know, it's a good thing we don't have something, you know, like that happens out in nature like when things fall on the ground to copy, um, the composting folks have, have got us covered with this. No, that's ridiculous. You make piles. Um, you know, this isn't even, I don't even do it this fancy. I live on a, a dead end. I just make piles out in the woods and, um, you know, when they've broken down enough, I'll scoop them into a, a wheelbarrow and move it to where I want. But, but, you know, here it is. You put all your organic matter into a pile. If you want it to break down faster and it's hot and dry, you can put some water on it. You don't have to. If you don't water it, everything will kind of just come to a stop while it's bone dry. Then when it gets moist again, it'll, it'll start going again. Um, if, uh, if it starts to smell a little funky, starts to smell like ammonia, then it needs some air in there. You get a pitchfork in there, you turn it over, you, you, you flip the pile. That's all you need to do. You have a couple piles going, you have a pile of, of compost that you're using, you have a pile that you're throwing new, comp new material in, and then you have a pile that, that's kind of breaking down that you're waiting on. But, you know, people tell you you got to flip it all the time, you got to move it. That, that stuff happens in nature. It breaks down. It does not have somebody out there um, um, turning it constantly. It's not rocket science, it's a natural process. So, uh, you know, every time I see this, I think there is, there is somebody who saw that and decided that they are not going to compost. <laughs> um, and organic matter is what you need. It's good for what ails you. If you got, if you got um, sandy soils, put it in compost. If you got clay soils, you put in compost. Um, it's all about organic matter. And that's <coughs> wherever you're getting that organic matter. As Danny Warner here used to say, carbon's carbon. You know, that's, it, it doesn't really matter. You know, and of course, mulching. <laughs> it's so nice to be here. When I was in Norfolk, I was, was afraid to use these slides because this was directly across from my, my kids' uh, elementary school. Um, you know, this person heard that mulching was important. <laughs> they were 100% on board. Mulching, it is important. It's, it's you know, you get, uh, it keeps moisture in the soil. You know, for us in the South, it's not about keeping soils warm. It's about keeping moisture in the soil. It's about blocking light so that weed seeds don't germinate. So if you have a fine mulch, you can have a, a relatively fine mulch. You can have a relatively thin layer. I don't know if anybody still uses those big, chunky, 
pine um, bark, those giant nuggets. With that, you need like four, six inches of that because sunlight can get through those big chunks. You do not need a foot and a half of it wherever you are. This person really liked it. This is <laughs> Honest goodness, that is the same. You know, and, and I will tell you that pine needles that fall from pines in your yard will do the exact same job as if they come in bales. <laughs> I, had, I had a neighbor, I just moved a house, but my old neighbor would get rid of all the leaves and everything, and then the, some bales of pine straw would show up at the house. That's like, what, you know, it's like you're doubling your work there. Now, the number one thing, way to be successful in gardening is to buy good plants. You got your soil ready, the next thing is buy good plants. I know that there are people in this audience who go to the nursery and they go back into that back corner to the bargain basement and they buy plants back there. There's a reason they're back there. Because they're no good anymore. And nurserymen are too cheap to compost their own plants, so they send them home with you so you can plant them and then compost them. Don't buy bad plants. Don't buy them cheap. You don't go out to, you know, you don't go to the furniture store and say, hey, I want that that couch with three legs and then bring it home and complain that it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Don't buy bad plants. Plants are not expensive. I, I hear this all the time. You know, the one that I, when I talk about Daphne, and, and some of you have heard me say this, I'm sure, because I say it all the time. You know, I, I'll say something about how great Daphne is. Some of you will raise their hand and say, my Daphne die after you know four years, that's as long as I can keep it alive, it dies. And I say, okay, so you paid what? $35, $40 for your, your Daphne? and you had four years of one of the most amazing plants in the world, that winter fragrance, evergreen foliage, phenomenal. You paid $10 a year for a plant that gave you pleasure all year round, and you will go to Dead Lobster and have bad seafood, <laughs> pay 30 bucks, and not complain at all. You will think you got a fair deal. That is insane. Plants live a long time. You know, I hear, you know, Tony introduced me, people complain about Tony's plants being expensive. You know, you buy epimedium for what, 18, 18 bucks? How long will epimedium live? Longer than you? <laughs> you know, I mean, unless you're harvesting it for horny goat weed, it'll keep, it'll keep living. So buy good plants. If you buy this stuff, it's, it's gonna die. You know, I, I have an extension appointment, so I have to answer a lot, of, a lot of questions. And I will get this, and people will say, what do I do for my plant? Cut it down, <laughs> get rid of it, plant something else. And they'll say, but, but trees are so expensive. What can I buy to spray on it? <laughs> no. You know, it's, if it was looked good the year before, then you've got plenty of, plenty of use out of it. Put something else in there. People are so afraid to get rid of plants. Rip them up, throw them away. If, if, even if it's beautiful, if you don't like the plant, get rid of it. People are, feel guilty about killing plants. Don't feel guilty about killing plants. We do it all the time out here. <laughs> Sometimes on purpose. You know where I get this, and I will hear, what, what do I do for my plant? It does this every year. If it does it every year, then it's not a good plant. Uh, you know, unless your, your great-grandmother smuggled it out of Nazi-occupied Germany, you can get rid of it. It is okay. You don't need to keep it forever and ever. Just get rid of it. So, you know, speaking of pests, there are a lot of pests out there, and some you can live with, some you can't, you know. I, I learned to live with uh, uh, Japanese beetles in the garden. You know, they get their hibiscus, they, they skeletonize it. If, if I were to find, you know, if Tony were to start selling a little perennial hibiscus where the leaves were lacy like that, and he, he put in some, some kind of veiled reference to lingerie in the cultivar, I would get this plant. And I'd probably pay a lot of money for it and love it. So I just try and live with the, the Japanese beetles. There, you know. If they get too bad, cut the plant down and let it, let it re-sprout. Um, this, to me, is the worst gardening pest in North Carolina. I can live with Japanese beetles. I can live with a lot of things. Mosquitoes, they are awful. That, that's the one thing that will keep me inside during the middle of the summer are the, the, the mosquitoes. Um, although, I have recently learned that uh, beautyberry, calicarpa leaves, they are native calicarpa, you take that and you crush the leaves, you rub it on you, and the mosquitoes won't bite you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it does anything for ticks. <laughs> You know, I, I had the newspaper, and I don't know if anybody saw the article that was in the newspaper this weekend. Yes. 
I sat and had had lunch and talked with with uh, uh, the the writer for about an hour and a half, and I said about 30 seconds of, of something about armadillos. Yeah. <laughs> and what's the headline? Something about armadillo invasion. Yeah. <laughs> Which sounds funny, but the nine-banded armadillo is on its way here. And if you think that rabbits are bad in your garden, where do you have armadillos? I mean, I, I, we used to have rabbit, a rabbit that was always, every morning it was out, and it, I would come out and you know the little uh, pellet guns, the little airsoft pellet guns. My son had one of those, and he used to go out in the morning and shoot it. Didn't bother the rabbit; it would come back every every day. But at least it felt good. Yeah, you know, this thing doesn't really care if you do that. And they are they are so destructive. They dig everything. And I've seen reports that you put down pine straw, and they don't like pine straw. Well, the first time I saw uh, armadillo damage was in the the piney woods of East Texas, where they did not seem to mind pine straw at all. And what's more, unless they've got young, they don't nest. They just keep, they're just uh, wandering animals. They go around, so you can trap it, you can kill it, you can do whatever. The next day, a, a new one may come traipsing right through your garden again. Um, this is what they're doing. They were in, in like 1850, they had not crossed uh, the Rio Grande. They were not in North America. Uh, or in uh, the, the U.S. They have crossed um, the Rubicon twice. They got across the Rio Grande, they got across the Mississippi. They're coming close. They hit the Atlantic and they're going north now, so um, expect to see them. So, up the garden. I have just about nothing in the garden, in, in the book, about turf because I don't consider turf gardening. Um, it can be a garden feature. It can be, you know, it's got its place. But if, uh, if you don't have kids who are playing soccer, or you don't have a dog that's running around, and really dogs don't care if they're on the grass or something else, um, you do not need a half acre, an acre of, of uh, you know, finely manicured lawn. It's, it doesn't do much for you. It doesn't support any kind of wildlife except for the, the Japanese beetle grubs um, who, that you don't want anyway. Yeah, it takes a lot of water, it takes a lot of chemicals, it takes a lot of fertilizers. If you do something like this, uh, like uh, uh, buffalo grass, it's drought tolerant. It hardly needs anything on it. It gives the effect. No, it is not. You know that dark emerald green. But you also don't need to water it and fertilize it, and you can mow it one time. How many people have lawns that the only time they ever step foot on that lawn is when they are fertilizing it, putting out weed killer, or mowing it? <laughs> and they talk about how, how much work gardening is. You know, if I put in more beds, it'd be more work. Like, you are out every week mowing that thing and weed eating and edging, and that's a lot of time you put in, and somehow nobody equates that with time spent in the garden. Because a lawn in the garden, that's fine. You know, there is a place for it if you have, if you really, you know, if you have a big spot and you really want some grass. You know, think about this. If this were all mowed, you would have, you would stand there at the house right here, and you would look down there and you'd say, huh, that's, that's nice, a meadow with some trees. You let that grow up, you've got all kinds of pollinator habitat, you've got all kinds of flowers going in there, and you mow a path in there, and all of a sudden you want to go down there. You want to see what's down there. It, it adds interest to it, where a lawn would be boring as all get up. You know, if you're going to do lawn, use it as a path, or use it as a feature. I, you know, make a little circle in your, you know, something that's negative space for you. But, you know, where it's a path, it's great to walk on. I never understood the signs that say, you know, stay off the grass, because that's the only reason to have that grass is so you can walk on it, because it feels good to walk on it. You know, and speaking of walking on things, other than sight, you know, in the garden, maybe maybe scent, but let's face it, you know, I'm, I, I don't have a good sense of smell, so maybe I'm wrong about this. But I don't feel like, except for when certain things are flowering, I don't walk through the garden and just think, Oh, it's heavenly fragrance out here, necessarily. But, but so feel, it, touch is, is kind of the next big sense that you get. And a lot of that is what you're walking on. And it might be grass. It might be something like a path like this, where you know, you're, you've got, it's a nice stable path, it's, it's, but you've got some loose gravel in there, so you've got some, some of that movement under your foot. And it gives you kind of a different feel than, than say, you know, a path like this would. You know, and this feels, you know, kind of the way they've, they've got the, the path and they got edged with rock. This is not an old garden. This is, this is a relatively new garden. 
and you know they just they put the, the little dry stack walls in there and then spread uh, uh, moss all over it and all of a sudden it feels like it's you know something from uh, uh, the Jurassic period out there you know turf again but this this garden is probably about as wild as this garden in terms of plants you got kind of mixed shrub borders, you got perennials all under there, you got bulbs that come up. It's actually pretty wild and woolly. It's, it's kind of hard to tell from this picture, but you can kind of see where things are hanging over and doing their thing. But you put that nice straight path in there, and all of a sudden it's, it's got this uh, kind of formal feel to it. Or this, no way, great age, you get some old, old bricks. You know, they can be expensive. They can either be free or very expensive. Um, you know, you put them out, you don't need to do a whole pathway in, in bricks. If you do little sections like this, and, and if you do this, kind of um, crown them up a little bit higher than the rest of the path so they stay up above it. You, know, you put out loose gravel, it looks like you're, you're, you've got a, an old um, feature that's crumbling away. Throw a little bit of you know, seeds and poppies and things like that in there alongside it, and all of a sudden you've got this kind of romantic old um, pathway. You know, and use your paths for when you're not walking on them. You're usually not scrolling through the garden when it's raining. So use them to move water through the garden. Um, a lot of gardeners, the way they solve their problems is they, they put a drain in and they get the water underground and try and move it away that way. The more you can keep your water above ground, the better off you're going to be. The more that's going to soak into the garden, um, the less that's going to go into the storm drains. Um, but you know it can wash away gardens. So if you if you think about you know pads as ways to move water, um, you can be very effective that way. And also um, you know look at look at this. You got this is a mulch path over here off the screen. This is a gravel path. You got these great old wood, uh, stone steps. And then this here. No matter which way you come, when you get to that pad, you feel like you you're you transitioning. You're going from one type of pathway, stairs, one type of material, to something else. And it's a real simple thing to do in a garden, if you want to get people to stop somewhere, is to just change what's happening under their feet. Because that slows people down, it gets them more aware, they think, something's changed, what, what am I looking at here? Even if it didn't, you, you don't, here you're giving them options of different ways to go, but even if you're not doing that, if you just do something in a path, it, it kind of forces you to, to stop and think about it a little bit. You know, maybe something like this. Chanticleer, this is a Chanticleer. Chanticleer up in uh, Pennsylvania is great with what they do with their paths. They really do do a lot there. So they've got this, this kind of, um, you know, these flagstones and then kind of a hodgepodge here. But this, this section right here really kind of stops you and, and cues you in that you're moving from one type of area to another type of area. And they can be art. Duke, this is Duke. They're doing some great things out at Duke Gardens. They really are. Um, if you haven't been out in a while, you should you should go there. Um, but isn't that that's that's a piece of art um, in, in the path? And how simple is that? You know, that's just a, a grid path with some cobblestones um, laid in there. You know, or this isn't this art? You know, under your feet. And how simple is that? That's four elements in there. You've got dwarf mondo grass. You've got a sedum. You've got kind of irregular field stone, and then you've got some dimension cut stone right there. And that is mesmerizing, that, that uh, little labyrinth. Mm -hmm. And I would say, if I were doing that, you know, I probably would have looked at that and said, you know, doing the, either turf or dwarf mondo all around there, but that sedum adds a completely different, different layer to it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, give some people somewhere to go. If you're, if you're, you're making those paths, um, give them a, a destination to get to when they, they get to the end. You know, or entice them through a gateway. Gateways in garden, people want to go through there. It's something, you know, it's that secret garden thing. What's behind there? Uh, my, my family's from New Orleans, and, you know, you walk around, the same thing in Charleston. You, you see little peaks, you see little glimpses of, of gardens behind these walls and gates, and you really want to go in there and see what's in there. Usually, if you get in there, it's nothing that great, but it's that, you know, being, being teased with it. And so, you know, this, you want to go through there and see what's back there. Tell you what's back there. It's the National Collection of Akuba. So nobody in, in the UK, nobody wants to really go through there except for me. Um, you know, this, you know, you got a lot going on here, don't you? You know, you got moon gates, you've got paths and beds and uprights. 
statues, but look how simple the plant material is. You know, if you're going to have a whole lot going on, you know, you can get pretty simple with uh, panicled hydrangeas and boxwoods and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, the, the opposite end of that is somewhere like Montrose where, you know, the garden is so exuberant, there's so much going on, you almost need something to, to narrow your vision down. And, you know, everybody I know who takes a picture there always goes into the, under those, um, the, these arches here, this, this structure, and it's, I think it's because naturally we just gotta, gotta narrow down what all's gonna happen. You get in there and you, you kind of frame that, that view so you can kind of really just see what's happening there. You know, when you do a lot of plants, you know, you get to notice, when, when I like a garden, it's got a lot of plants in there. Um, and that's for a couple reasons. One, if you got a lot of plants, you don't have a lot of weeds. You know, weeds need, need sunlight to grow, uh, you know, get rid of them. But there's also, you know, this, this is in fall. This is gonna die out, you know, the grasses will, will turn brown for the winter, but you'll still have um, junipers and and Icea and uh, yeah, there's a lot going on all winter long. And the same thing here. You know, there's no weeds in this garden. Not, no room for weeds. Well, here I had a boss. My my boss when I was in North, who used to say he was not a plantsman. We would drive around on the golf cart uh, every once in a while, and anywhere there was there was more than about four square feet of space, he would say we should put something there. Maybe daylilies, and I got to hate daylilies because that was that was his for everything. And they're wonderful plants, but man, he wanted to put a daylily everywhere. But he used to say, and this used to push me over the edge. But I've I've come to to realize there there is a, a, an element of truth to this: is that if you have a nice clean edge and a good layer of mulch, it almost doesn't matter what's in the bed. For a lot of people, when they're walking through, it looks tidy if you got that clean edge going on there. Now this is pretty tidy, but you know, and there's great ways to use color. I, uh, whenever if I if I plant something out, if the colors really go well together, it is a complete accident. So, <laughs> I'm the first to admit that. You know, and you know, I like gardens that transition. You know, in the spring when there aren't all the leaves out, you've got. You know, you've got azaleas and this primula flowering, and then as you go past that, it gets hotter and uh, at more into summer. You know, you've just got these ferns and hostas out there that really lush green that cools everything off. You know, with this with hardly any perennials at all, just woody plants. You know, with this, this is <clears throat> I put this in. This was a garden. I was with somebody else, and they said, "Yeah, this garden's kind of a mess." You start looking around in this garden, and there are really virtually no weeds. It is just kind of this over-the-top things growing on top of each other and, and really going. That's the hardest kind of kind of garden to maintain in, in my mind. It's almost natural-looking things, but you don't have to have a million plants. You can have something simple and, and elegant and still be still be beautiful. So, you know, in the garden. Um, you know, furniture is important. How you how you dress up your your garden. I, you know, I like I tell people think the garden's like a room. You know, you got floor, you've got walls with the shrubs and plants around there. You've got you've got a ceiling, which might be the sky. It might be um, trees overhead, and then you've got to furnish it. Um, you know, and and people go out and buy you know cheap plastic furniture that probably break. You know, two years down the road when you know Great Aunt Sally sits down on it, will crumple up into pieces. And, and we'll do that because something like this is expensive. You know, a wood table, I mean, a, a stone table like that, that's expensive. But that's going to last you forever. You know, I mean, that's going to outlast you. It's, it's stone. It's here before you'll be going after there afterwards. And if you use these, things like these natural materials in a woodland garden, um, you really look great. You know, you get, you know, put some of your artistic style in there, some, a tile bench, and, and an old rustic bench. You know, that, uh, to me, that pulls that whole thing together. You know, we're on a mountainside. This was in, in a mountain garden. This is on the side of a mountain. It's not actually in the south. Well, this is in the deep south. It's New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the real deep south. Um, but it was this rocky um, mountainside, and you know, this, this bench just built into the side, looking out over, over the water. It, was, um, it just fit there. 
And I had a whole bunch of gates, I put them all out, but I love this. This is actually our, our former department head, Julia Cornegay's, um, the entrance to her vegetable garden. And so this gate is tomato steaks that they've just kind of, it, I mean, it's put together well. It looks like it's just loose there. On the outside, it's hard to see. That's, that's not like a little leather holster of some kind, but it's got um, uh, uh, labels in there and a pair of pruners in there. So, you know, whenever you go up to the, the vegetable garden, you just get right in there and have your, have your stuff to work with. I love that. You know, in containers, containers are a great way to dress, dress up a garden. I love succulents in containers because I do travel a lot, and um, even when I am home, I am a lazy gardener. Uh, so you don't have to water them so much if you travel. And this thing is cool. This was this was one that had just been planted. It looks like white stone in there. Those are actually um, little white succulents all that are scattered through there as if they were stone. You know, they're just separate vitals um, crammed together. You know, but it doesn't have to be a lot. A little bit can go a long way if you, you know, if you repeat some elements. This is this is up at Wave Hill where they use plants uh, uh, phenomenally well. I, I haven't been there in 15 years, so I assume they're still doing a great job. But this is kind of a, I mean, there's sumac back here. It's the back side of a greenhouse. This is a, it's an old wall, but it's not a particularly attractive wall. This is the kind of thing that most people would be trying to hide. You know, put a fence up or something like that. But you put these three pots up. And all of a sudden, you know, you don't pay attention to any of the things around that. Um, that's the, the uh, you know, people have a big electrical box out in front. They, they plant, you know, shrubs all the way around it, and it draws your eye to it. Plant the prettiest flowering thing right there, and then nobody looks at the, the box. They look at this beautiful plant beside it. That's, that's kind of that. That's it. Or you can go bigger and get, you know, nice big pots that repeat through there. You know, you don't have to repeat the plant material. You can just repeat the pots. Isn't that great? Hang that on the wall. You know, or if you have an unused part of your patio that, you know, that, that corner that doesn't use, you jam a bunch of pots in there. Again, great for <coughs> lazy people like me because then you can water all at one time. You can even put a sprinkler on there and water them all. Uh, it's great. Coach Dooley down at Georgia, you know, you know the Coach Dooley, he was a, he's a avid, avid gardener down, down former coach at the University of Georgia. Um, and he said the most interesting thing to me. He, he said when he gets a tree, he pots it up and he puts it, he's got a big porch right behind his house, a big patio. He puts it out there and he lives with it for a season or two before he decides where he wants to, to plant it. So you go out there and it's, it's woody, a lot of woody stuff, so Japanese maples and conifers and things that he just has kind of scattered around as, as decorates. We'll put three or four of them together by the table and you know, more over here. I just thought that was great that he lives with them for a year or two. I keep things in pots for a year or two, but that's just because I don't get around to get them in the <laughs> Or this. This is, again, a wave hill. I've always wanted to replicate that. Yeah, and you can do some, some cool things. These are plywood containers. Isn't that cool? They're just they're painted with marine grade paint on the inside and then painted on the outside. They're not going to last as long as, as some other containers, but they'll last for several years. You can put something big in there. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. And you can repaint it every year, change it up with your tools. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it doesn't even have to be a container. You know, an old wheelbarrow that's, that's broken, an old bike. You know, or something simple that helps echo what, what's going on in your garden. So plants, you know, plants are really, you know, that's, that's the real decor. And I, you know, when I talk to other groups, I'm talking about plants they probably don't know. You know, those of our members here, y'all, y'all know all these plants I'm going to talk about because we grow them here at the Arboretum. This was with with Timber Press. This was one of the things where we went back and forth on. Uh, you know, they they told me they wanted me to write a book that wasn't for the the you know absolute novice gardener. They wanted it for the, the an intermediate gardener. And so they asked for a plant list, and I sent them a plant list. And they came sent it back and said, "Whoa, that's you know." can't do that plant list. That's, you know, what about these plants? I said, well, a lot of those plants don't grow well in the south, or will grow maybe in one little bit of the mountains, or, you know, but they don't grow well in the south. Just because everybody keeps putting them in books for the south doesn't mean they actually grow in the south. <laughs> and a lot of them are things that everybody knows. If you're an intermediate gardener, you know stuff. Why, why do I have to write about it again? It's in every other book. Just let's skip it. So, and there's so many cool things out here. This is a a uh, Dysperopsis uh, that's unknown species. But look at that, that purple flowers like that. Isn't that great? 
there's so many neat things out there, neat perennials. This, uh, this we're growing in our lath house. Got it uh, on a lark. Uh, we kept it in the greenhouse for quite a while because we knew it wasn't hardy. It grows in the mountains of Ethiopia. It's, a, it's an acanthus. You know acanthus? Big, leafy, uh, um, perennial, herbaceous perennial. This is a shrub. It makes a big mound in the mountains. It's, it's adapted for goats, so it is viciously spiny. Here it dies back during the winter, but then it pops up and kind of has these you know, kind of long scrabbling branches with this beautiful foliage. And then if it doesn't get frosted, it, it flowers really late, like late October, November. If it doesn't get frosted, you get these red acanthus flowers on, on the tops of the stems. But it wouldn't have to flower. The foliage is amazing. Yeah. Why isn't that growing all through the south? And we had a we had a great tree that was growing here that we sent off to uh, one of the the big the big big tree grower um, on the west coast who does a lot of the the liners uh, for for nurseries all over the country. And they said, yeah, it's a great tree, but it's not as cold hardy. It was a black gum. The one up by the that used to be by the visitor center. They said it's 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 not as hardy as some of the other ones. And most of our market is through the north. And they're missing the boat. You know, you look at lists of where the U.S. is growing. It's growing in the South. So the idea that they're not, you know, targeting plants that will do better in the South. You know, you want to know a secret? October Glory Red Maple is not a good maple for the South. There are some much better ones, but nobody grows them because they think that people don't buy plants in the South. Um, I don't know why that is. But they go to the remainder section and buy it. <laughs> You know, orchids, you know, these have such a reputation of being difficult to grow, and that's because people dug our native ones in the wild and killed them. You, that's a sure way to have a dead plant, is to go dig a native, one of our native slipper orchids. They're very difficult to, to move. Tony, years ago, told me the secret of that. I, I can't even remember how long ago. It was probably 15, 18 years ago. I won't pass it on so you don't go dig them up in the wild. You will kill it if you dig it up. But these hybrids that, that are being sold are great garden plants. I mean, they are vigorous. Um, you know, we don't really grow much of them here because uh, that's the kind of thing that people get a little too excited about on a weekend when nobody else is around. There's no staff here, so we stay away from them. But I watch them um, a lot at Tony's, and I've grown them in, in my own garden. And boy, they're vigorous. They flower like crazy. They're great. The front of my book has, has Spigelia marilandica, the, um, uh, one of our great native uh, uh, plants. But you know there's another one, there's a pink uh, species of that same thing. It's restricted to a couple of areas in um, Florida and Alabama, so it's federally endangered. You can't, you know, it can't be shipped across uh, state lines because we'd hate for it to be growing somewhere else and do well and survive. <laughs> You know, there's two there's two subspecies or varieties, and you know, the one of them that grows in one location in Alabama, by God, we got to keep that in that one location in Alabama. But sometimes you can find this if you look hard enough, and it's a cool plant. Or this, we have we've distributed this. We we put this on a list, and nobody wanted the thing. It seemed like this is a plant with no good common name, Titanotrichum old hamii. This is one that, that Tony and I, when we spent a month together, which incidentally, you know how you spend a month with Tony? Yeah. Is you just agree with him. Agree with him all the time, you're the best traveling companion ever. Um, <laughs> um, but this was what, you know, look at the, this is the kind of plant that you look at as a gardener and you say, there has got to be variation out there. You know, what we grow looks like this. But in the wild, anything with that deep a gold, uh, uh, flower with that dark burgundy red throat, there has got to be variation. There's got to be all gold ones. There's got to be ones with burgundy on the outside. And this grows in Taiwan. And we found this thing. And every single one of them is identical <coughs> to what we grow in, in cultivation. There was no variation. But it's, it's an African violet relative. It grows in shade. It flowers late in the fall. When, what else is flowering in, in the shade garden in fall? It, with nothing, nothing. You maybe have some cyclamen that are getting started. They're starting to go. This is great. It propagates easily. It grows well. It spreads and bulks up well. Why isn't this a mainstay in, in our gardens? Well, because it flowers when nobody's going to buy plants, and it doesn't have a good common name. It's the only reason I can think of. 
You know, grasses are great. I don't put a lot of grasses in this talk, but this is one that I really love for kind of warmer gardens. Uh, Malinus nerviglumis. I love that, that uh, name. Uh, pink crystals grass. Blue, and then it's got these airy pink flowers and seed heads above it. Uh, we had a meeting with a public gardens association, association meeting in Norfolk when I was there, and I was sh doing a tour, and I showed uh, a bunch of the, the folks this plant. And when I went by later on that afternoon, the, it was completely bare. A whole big planting of it. There was not a seed head left on it. They just got to it and it all. Um, it's not super hardy. You know, here it'd probably be pretty uh, uh, borderline, but certainly zone eight gardens it does as well. The shrubs. Now I'm going to. 100 uh, slides of a Cuba in here. <laughs> Those of you who know how much I love it. No, I, I won't, but, um, but even with something common like a Cuba, there's so much out there that we just don't know. I mean, there's all these other species that we don't grow, but even the species, that even the, you know, the common Acuba japonica that we grow, um, do you know there are ones that come out pure white and then go dark green over the summer? How cool is that, you know? I actually had somebody gave a talk, showed this picture, actually had a second picture of it, and they said, what do the flowers look like? <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> you know? Have you ever seen a poinsettia flowers? They're not much. It's leaves you're looking at. Think of this as a, 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 a evergreen Akuba shrub, a, a poinsettia shrub. You know our figs? We know our edible figs. We know creeping figs. What about this Afghanistan fig? Ficus afghanistanica. Silver liar. Look at that, isn't that beautiful? And yes, it does produce fruit, and yes, it is edible. Um, no, it is not palatable. <laughs> um, but it had a neat, neat texture in the garden. Here, this. Oh, it took three trips to Japan to bring this back and keep it alive. But it is growing right outside the visitor center, I mean, right outside the McSwain Center. This is a spice bush, Lindera. Spicebush swallowtails love it. Uh, it's one we call Kodorashi, <coughs> which is the name of a little five spice blend uh, that you get on, that they put on the table, like salt and pepper in Japan, and all the Japanese fast food restaurants. And it comes out with these chartreuse, um, yellowy green leaves, speckled with green. Isn't that beautiful? Ah, that's one of my favorite plants of all time. Schefflera's. It was here before I worked here that I learned that there were hardy Schefflera's. I had no idea. I came to a talk, Dan Hinckley was talking about collecting chefflers and blew my mind. Um, look at that. that, that is amazing. Uh, that's it in flower. This is it right now, the new growth coming out on there. Incredible. Chefflera delvei, perfectly, perfectly fine for us. Does great. Really cold winter, you can get some damage, but give it some high shade, it'll be fine. Hornbeams, the monkey tail um, hornbeam, Arpinus fangiana, was one of those uh, Holy Grail plants, but you know that this this is you know you gotta go to travel to China and track this tree down and you know eat bad food and uh, whatever. Not all bad food, oh, that's good. But we have this. This is a native plant. This is yellow wood. I don't know why this isn't the most planted native uh, flowering tree around. Look at that, isn't that gorgeous? Like ice crystals fall coming off this thing. It is so pretty, and I'll tell you why it isn't more widely grown. It is not a pretty young plant. And as a young plant, it just kind of looks kind of lanky and uh, wonky in a pot. Uh, put it in the ground, in a couple of years, it, it starts becoming beautiful. You know, right outside here, dog, this dogwood. Uh, we're we're going to get, I'm going to get this plant into the trade. That, that is my goal. I am, I am going to do it. Cornus wilsonian. Look at that bark. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. Nice flowers. Um, I am told, again, not, not much of a sense of smell, I'm told it smells a little fishy for about a day or two um, when it first comes into flower. And it has blue fruits. It's gorgeous. There are another native, uh, Nyssa. There are all kinds of great forms of our native plants. This is Sherry's Cloud. This is a black gum, toot, water toot lemon, whatever you want to call it. This was found on a mountaintop in Arkansas. Uh, yeah, the, the, I, I used to have arguments. I had a big native plant garden at the last garden I worked at. And the native plant people got really mad when I planted variegated dogwoods. And I said, it's still a dogwood. It's, you know, what are you complaining about? It's still a great native plant. Or this. This is an evergreen oak. Um, this is what's it's planted all along uh, Western <coughs> Boulevard right behind uh, campus over here. I was out with, with campus, one of the campus landscape architects, uh, the, the NC State uh, arborist, 
And I was showing there's a huge one, biggest one I've ever seen in China or here um, in the Court of North Carolina planted down there. And I was showing them that uh, and saying something about them being planted all along, um, along Western. They're like, we've never seen that out there. I don't, are you sure about that? And we had to go out there and show them these beautiful trees. So maybe we should plant more of those. That's a nice tree. Yeah, you know, vines, cancer. Vines for shade. How many vines for shade are there? You know, there's Japanese honeysuckle, which does great in, in shade, and there's poison ivy, which does great in shade. <laughs> you know, this is Cadsura japonica. This is an evergreen vine for shade. And, you know, there are other forms. You don't have to get variegated, but the variegated ones brighten up the dark. Or, or you know, honeysuckles have gotten a bad rap, but this Lanisra reticulata, Kinsley's ghost, these flowers are tiny. They're, they're right in the center there. They're real tiny, but then you have this silvery, um, it's not really a bract, but the conate leaves behind it that's, that's gorgeous. So, you know, the key is whatever, you know, whatever you love um, is, is what you should do. If you love that exuberant type of garden, you know, plant, some, plant one of everything. Yeah, if you like something a little bit more refined, uh, you can do that. You can plant parterres and pollard your, your trees. That is, if you're going to hack at your, your, your crepe myrtles, do it this way. <laughs> um, you know, and elegance doesn't have to be on a big scale. Isn't this great? Um, who was here for our fall, uh, our fall symposium? A few of y'all were. This is actually not from the south. This is from Matthew Pottage's home kind of garden. Um, but, but look at this. You know, and so this is a kind of a big rounded area of, of turf that comes up to his patio. And so he just dug that out and planted that. He said the previous year, right out here in the center, he had cut a perfectly round circle and put that same pot with that same um, agave right in the middle of that and had planted something different around it. You know, it's, it's not, it's, it's something pretty easy. You know, it's a couple hours worth of work. And look how elegant it looks, you know? So whatever, whatever makes you happy, I love that. So I'm lucky, I get to travel all over, you know, get to go down to Hemingway's house in Cuba and go live with the, the Chachi in, in Ecuador and visit the great gardens of the world like Kirstenbosch and uh, the Dunedin Botanic Garden in New Zealand. Go all over China and it's great, you see all these other gardens and what they're doing, um, but it's really nice. One day, traveling through Taiwan, <laughs> that we are getting our culture out there. <laughs> the South is getting out there. <laughs> so, thank you all for listening to me. And, uh, Everybody asks me their questions all the time. So. <laughs> Kadsura, K A D S U R A, Kadsura japonica. And that particular one was one called Fukuri. <laughs> Plant on the cover of the book is Spigelia marilandica, which is what, Indian pink root. Is that the that mm -hmm. combination? Indian pink root. With that. But that's a great native plant. It's, it's a really um, fabulous uh, plant. Have you been to the Bouchard Gardens? I have been to the Bouchard Gardens. They're quite beautiful. They are. I actually I actually pulled a, a slide out. They've got this one thing. You know, there's all kinds of things going on at Bouchard, but there's right up near the front. They've got this dense, dense hedge um, with this white arbor that's in there that the hedge goes right around. I think it's, it's really a beautiful kind of kind of picture. There's a lot of that one. That's kind of understated. There, the rest of it's all um, lots of color. Right. Any other questions? All right. So I covered it all. Thank you all for listening to me. We're proud of you, Mark.